Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show, where we talk all things vegan. If you're not already vegan, no worries, we'll get you there. If you are, tune in for health advice, information on climate change, and all the damage done by our most destructive industry, animal agriculture. We'll also talk cooking, theater, film, and culture. My two reasons for starting this podcast, to entertain, to inform, and to make people vegan. Oh, that's three. Shit. Hello and welcome to the Glenn Merzer Show. You can find us across all podcast platforms. You can find us at YouTube. You could find us at realmeneatplants.com. My guest today is Dr. Zach Burns, a third-year family medicine resident. Zach has delved into the physiology of food, studying the mechanisms by which standard fare causes disease while whole plant foods prevent it. He's the founder of the student organization Plant-Based Healthcare. He served as the outreach director for moving medicine forward with the mission of cultivating a generation of nutritionally aware physicians who are prepared to tackle our chronic disease burden. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Glenn. Now, you and I met through our mutual friend, Dr. Michael Clapper. You've worked with him on moving medicine forward. Uh, tell me about why that has become a, a focus of your work. Well, I'll go back to how we met. Dr. Clapper, was, if you asked me five years ago, you know, if there were a few people in the entire world who you'd want to meet, um, name a few, he'd be on that list. And it's, I still am starstruck. Um, now I work closely with him and it's really been a privilege. Basically, I had that student group in med school down in Florida. And on a whim, I asked if he would speak at our school. I submitted a form through his website and I thought there's no chance. We didn't even have a budget, but I like to ask big and uh, see what happens. And of course, he's so gracious. He said, of course, yeah, I'll, I'll speak at your school and we don't need compensation. And he showed up and we had this, uh, we, we connected, you know, after his presentation, which went really well, we uh, had a meeting outside in the courtyard with some of his team. And we were thinking strategically about how to get this message to more medical students. And that started our, our partnership. He was just launching Moving Medicine Forward. And I offered to be someone inside the medical system currently being trained who could set him up with different med student groups and try to infiltrate the curricula around the country, uh, which we've done. So, um, but your question was slightly different. I think I was giving some context. You we were asking about what we're up to now. Right. So, Go ahead. What are you up to now? <laughs> so, we are still uh, moving medicine forward. Um, we have we've grown the organization so that he has a full-time staff member. So we're able to connect with medical students, residents, even undergraduates across the country, actually internationally, mostly US and Canada. And so he's speaking regularly on these campuses and increasingly over Zoom to get the message out. And we have plans to try to keep the momentum once he's spoken on campus so that uh, the students have material to work with. They can cultivate this knowledge. Uh, even if they're not presently at his lecture, they can do journal clubs. They can meet with us subsequently so that we're supplementing their traditional curriculum. So that when they graduate medical school, the goal is they have some level of nutritional literacy, uh, which we feel is integral to to tackling chronic disease we can't really we won't tackle chronic disease and the burden um, on our society if we don't get serious about the role of food in its prevention and reversal now let's go back further in your history when did you become vegan or plant-based i it was 2014 so it was it was almost 10 years ago um, okay. Next month will be my vegan anniversary. Okay. And so what 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 moved you to to go vegan? 
a few things. You want the, the short version or? We can do the long version. That's fine. I'll give you the medium. I don't want anyone okay. to get bored. Um, all right. So I grew up in, in a progressive household and, and, you know, we had notions of, of finite resources instilled in us and we kept the heat pretty low in the winter near Boston. Um, and, you know, if we, if, if I kept the lights on, I'd be sort of reprimanded. There was that, these ideas were, were in, in my mind, but I wasn't politically active, socially active in high school. I was running around playing soccer, playing jazz piano, I had friends and, and, and studying. And uh, I was just really sort of sheltered, um, to be frank. I got to, sh to college and I discovered the, the ills of the world. I just, there are all these really active student groups demonstrating on this cause and that cause. I, I became quickly politicized. It was, I found it energizing to, um, to take a stand, to learn about some issues and, 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 you know, be a voice on some of them, um, namely environmental issues. So in college, I ran the compost committee. So I was scooting around in this golf cart, um, digging out, you know, like stirring the compost bins all over campus and, uh, and, you know, handling worms and, and, um, picking out people's Doritos bags that they inappropriately put in the compost bin, stuff like that. And we'd take all the material to the farm, put in these big earth tubs, um, put in the dry matter and, and stir it up. And it was so refreshing uh, amidst the, the books and the libraries it, and the classrooms. Is that why sometimes when I buy fresh vegetables, I see a little bit of a Doritos bag <laughs> inside the zucchini? Could, that yeah. could have been you i think that's the big zucchini industry trying to make them more palatable okay yeah so um, uh so you were doing all this uh you know cause oriented work in college but you weren't yeah. yet vegan right so so freshman year i took a class called american food mm -hmm. and sort of you can tell what's going to be in that curriculum and it was really just unsettling we read the jungle. Um, we I, so I, I just learned what factory farming was. Uh, mm -hmm. Hadn't known about it before. The, the the industry is so effective at shielding the truth about how animals arrive on our plate or in our glass that I didn't know. So once I knew about factory farming, I, I went vegetarian. That was freshman year of college. But I was not ready to go vegan. I thought it would be a sacrifice. Uh, I thought I would seem weird to friends and girlfriends. I thought it just would be a, a huge, it just wouldn't be any fun um, that some of my favorite foods would be off limits. So I didn't have the so courage. Let me, let me interrupt. You were still having cheese, still having dairy products. Were you still having eggs? Right. Okay. Right. So it took me three and a half years between going vegetarian to going vegan. So how did that happen? There were a couple uh, influences. One was I, I got to go to India um, one of those summers volunteering and we visited a dairy farm and I saw these cows, just deranged looking cows, the flies swarming. They just looked miserable. Um, and, and there was an older volunteer, a, a med student at the time, and I was pre-med and I, he was really bright. I looked up to this guy and he said, if you're in this at all, if you're doing this vegetarian thing for, for animal ethics, you might want to consider the, uh, the dairy cows and the laying hens whose lives are often worse than their counterparts in the beef and, and chicken industry. And that sat with me um, for a while. And, and, you know, and then there were some other things and um, I was, I was studying, I was a philosophy major. And so I got to think deeply about, um, moral philosophy like how do we justify what we do and i was thinking about different classic moral philosophies and the in um, the, the contemporary issues and how we really think you know so I, I basically the more one thinks um the the more likely one is to become vegan <laughs> so right. I feel. And I, but I'm, I'm lucky right not everyone got to sit around in college and, and ponder these issues so I'm very lucky. And so now, you know, so it was senior year. I said, this is enough. Um, I went vegan in uh, March 2014. Okay. So you were vegan before you started medical school. Right. 
So you go to medical school and were you already of the mind that a lot of our um, a lot of our diseases that are afflicting the American population, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, are caused by the animal-based diet. Right, yes. Because I had a few years between college and med school. I was working, I, was, I worked for, this is a, it was sort of a monumental piece of the story. So I'll, basically my first year out of college, I had uh, this gig in a nonprofit. We were working on different progressive campaigns for environmental issues, um, uh, public health, and antibiotics um, reform. And one of the campaigns was trying to get soda bottles recycled more readily. Okay. And it just on a state level in Massachusetts. And you'd think it's common sense, but it turns out that the soda industry was going to have to pay a fraction of a cent extra per bottle to facilitate that recycling. And they decided it was not legislation that they supported. And so they put millions of dollars into the, the opposition campaign and they won. You know, it was very calculated. Um, they went door to door, um, despite our huge effort that we worked our butts off on this thing, a statewide initiative. Um, they, they won. We, we were unsuccessful uh, increasing recycling a little bit. And, and that struck because because you sort of, I knew in an abstract sense the, the influence of corporate interests. And um, I didn't see it firsthand until then. And it was really shocking. And so that opened me. I just now I have this, um, this, this sense. And I think it's a really important piece of, of the, of the um, vegan story is how uh, private interests are monopolizing the conversation and, and impeding progress. I think our, you know, our society would be plant-based already um, were it not for the, the entrenched interests. Now, now, out of curiosity, what was the corporate argument for not recycling? What was their case? Oh, you mean what they said in public? Yeah, yeah. When they put commercials on the TV, they said they would say, "Don't recycle because there's an infinite number of soda cans we can make." What What was their argument? That's a great question. I don't remember. Oh, um, okay. It's... Yeah, it certainly wasn't compelling, but um, they tried, you know, they just well, they it was succeeded, of, whatever their argument was, they, it was right. convinced a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it was this right. So you're right, it was compelling, but it was a scam. Um, and, and, you know, once you see the, the lies that the different companies put out there very deliberately, um, you, then you see how the, the status quo exists. Um, so, so my, I'm, I'm just interested in, in seeing through the BS and, and um, really grasping the truth, right? Seeking yeah. truth and then sharing that with my colleagues, my friends. Um, so we can, so we can move on. Um, so you were already vegan. You were now becoming aware of corporate greed you go to medical school and you're taught about cardiovascular disease. What do they teach you is the cause of cardiovascular disease in medical school just a few years ago? Mm. Yeah, they, they didn't necessarily name a cause. They more just teach you about the pathophysiology what happens on a molecular level, right? And then they teach you about the standard treatment. Well, surely so, they're aware that the arteries have narrowed going to the heart. Right. So, so they talk but about they, that. They, they, they say, do they say etiology unknown? Do they say we don't know why the arteries narrow going to the, or do they say everyone as they get old, older their arteries narrow i mean surely they have to address this in some way what, what did they tell you i think what happens is it's just not that the, the the cause is just not what they emphasize so i think if you asked a, the professor um 
they might admit that there's a role in, in diet um, in the development of atherosclerosis, but is that what they really emphasize for the medical students? No, it's, they, they say, okay, the cause, well, it's a, it's a normal part of aging and maybe there's a little dietary component. Next slide. And then it, the majority of that lecture would have been, um, the, you know, the, the macrophages and the different, you know, the, the lipids accumulating in the, in the, in the atherosclerotic plaque and, and, and then the treatment. So, and, and the same, of course, goes for the other chronic illnesses. Wow. So, um, did, did you ever, you know, feel that, that the education you're getting is, is avoiding the truth? I did, because at that point I'd been enlightened to the power of plants. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, 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 I was, I respect the curriculum. It, it was amazing. It, of course, I was learning things that I didn't, it was a dream. It was my dream to, to be able to have that designated time to learn about the human body on, on that level of detail. And, it, and I, I treasure that education. Um, and I'm talking mostly about the, the first two years when you get really microscopic and learn the intricacies of, of the body and the organ systems and everything. Cause that stuff is, is objective. That's just, that's the science that the, that the um, docs and PhDs have elucidated over the last half century. And, and it's amazing stuff. But when they start getting into, uh, right, the cause and treatment of our major chronic diseases, I could see the, the bias and the, um, the, the omission of really important lifestyle info. And so did, that's... Mm -hmm. Did the subject ever come up? Did you or anyone else ever raise the issue in, in discussion? Well, it came up mostly outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's why, you know, my friend and I started this group, Plant-Based Healthcare. We felt an urgency around exposing, to our, 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 exposing our classmates to, um, to, to the root cause in treatment. So we would have meetings, we'd have panels. Um, Dr. Clapper spoke, others. We had potlucks, that was probably the most interesting part to a lot of our classmates. We just had awesome food. Amazing um, how well med students can cook. I'm not one of them, but uh -huh. people brought over amazing dishes. And, and that was the, the biggest sell, I think, for people who were just plant curious. Uh, we did some di you know, nu nutrition reform on campus. We, we petitioned other student groups to make commitments about their purchasing and it was uh, a passion project, so so we got a lot done. Um, I probably didn't study as much as I would have otherwise. I mean, I really, I was really into this, so uh, it was worth it. Um, and so when when Dr. Clapper spoke, uh, how many of your classmates were attending? It was a huge event. There were about four hundred people there. Wow. Now they weren't all. Yeah, they weren't all from the med school that we invited the community as well. Okay. Um, but I started planning several months in advance and partnered with people who were active on social media and all this stuff. So we uh -huh. made it a thing. We had vendors, you know, the local vegan restaurants donated some food and uh -huh. it was a pretty cool event. Um, and so how, how big was your medical school class? Medical school class was around 200. 200. And how many of those 200 do you think attended Dr. Clapper's lecture? I reckon, so what we, we, we I, I want to say, let's say 80. 80. Okay. Yeah. So those 80 good. students, most of whom I assume knew, knew little to nothing about plant-based nutrition before Dr. Clapper spoke. Afterwards, did you speak with many of them and did you feel that their eyes had opened up? 
Yeah, uh, definitely some of them. And remember that the two there are two classes that hang around a med school campus at a time. It's the first and second years. So imagine 80 times two. Um, there are, you know, many and faculty were there as well. Mm -hmm. So I had some good conversations after the event. You know, a portion of those people kind of went because they were getting um, some service requirement fulfilled. Uh, <laughs> they, they, you know, it's this like sort of exploratory requirement and they go uh, so they were just getting something signed off they might have been on their ipads sending um messages to each other during the thing mm -hmm. but um man you know definitely a subset of people were were moved by the presentation and and very much so and and they you know they you know, i had some faculty who were there who said that was the coolest event we've had in a long time um so they they appreciated it. Okay, so you didn't get pushback from the faculty uh, arguing against Dr. Clapper and plant-based nutrition. No, uh, we also didn't ask them directly uh -huh. to have the event. We sort of just uh -huh. did it. Went around them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now you are a, a doctor, but you're not an MD. You're a DO, a doctor of osteopathy. Is that correct? Correct. Now, why did you choose the DO route to being a doctor versus the MD? So the, the DO philosophy is a little different. Uh, brief history. So this guy, Andrew Still, in the mid-19th century uh, was an MD. And then he was like, the mainstream medicine isn't really working. Um, it's a little bit similar to today. He said, we're doing all this bloodletting and we're operating on people that are getting infected. And we're getting them addicted to opium. Um, this is not maybe we can do better as, as a medical community. So he studied bones. Um, he studied the skeletons of the deceased and all this stuff. And he, he, he was just, and he also had, a, you know, he had three children die of meningitis. It was sort of, um, uh, he had a lot of trauma, um, but so he, he was motivated by, a couple of different things and he became um the founder of osteopathy basically the idea is if you, if you can leverage the body's natural capacity to heal itself that's going to be the most potent form of healing um it's based it, it's a scientific practice there's nothing supernatural about it um but it one one of the the tangible part of being a do is the hands-on, we call it osteopathic manipulative medicine, OMM. And so not all, but a subset of practicing DOs utilize this manipulation um, to, to basically get the body back and to optimize the structure of the body so that the function of the body is also optimized. Now, how is that different from what I imagine a chiropractor does? of physical manipulation of the body. So there's this snobby rivalry between uh, DOs and chiropractors. Um, I don't, I don't like, I don't subscribe to the rivalry. I think chiropractors are cool, but I think the, the main difference is chiropractors are often doing bigger, um, higher velocity cracks. And, and, you know, if you imagine, wow, I just, the chiropractor really worked my back. Um, the, Osteopathic manipulative medicine looks more subtle. We are palpating uh, this the skin. We're we're thinking about the level of the anatomy, so so you can feel someone's neck. But, but you're, you know, are you feeling the fascia or the vertebrae, um, or or the the muscle? Okay, are you feeling if if you're on the head, are you feeling the cerebrospinal fluid um, percolating around the cranium? Um, mm -hmm. So you, you try to tune in really deeply and, and make subtle, subtle movements um, based on a, a deep understanding of, of our anatomy. Okay. And but of you... course, go ahead. So, so uh, the vast majority of practicing DOs don't do any of that stuff. Um, they, they work, it, it, they, it basically is indistinguishable from an MD and they work in every field of medicine, but then some of us, uh, take a, a liking to OMM and, and we continue with it. So 
a, a DO really is trained with the same basis of knowledge that an MD has. You have all the, you know, you, you assume pass all the same tests that somebody passes to become an MD and have all the same training, but you also have this additional uh, training in manipulative skills, right? Right. Virtually identical curriculum. Um, the board exams are different, but optionally as a DO, you can take the MD board exams, which I did um, just in, in case, you know, the admissions committees and residency care, um, which increasingly they don't. But, you know, so I took both. The, we're, our training is, is virtually the same. Um, now, there are some MDs. I've, I had an MD once in California who, in addition to being an MD, had training in acupuncture. Nice. So called himself an MD, he was an MD, but he occasionally mentioned, oh, also I can do acupuncture. Um, why Why with a DO, why, why do they take a, a different, uh, you know, different letters after their name? Why don't they just say we're, we're MDs and we also have this manipulative skill? Why do they do DO, which confuses people? It is confusing, but I think it's just a matter of education. Okay. You know, a third of medical students in the country today are DO medical students. A and third. So, it, right. So yeah. it's it's a it's a you know it. There are more MDs currently practicing, but the tides are are turning, and so um, it's just I think it'll become more and more understood. Now, I think if the majority of the DOs are not doing. The OMM, and that stands again for what? Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine. Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine. If, if most of them are not doing that, what is the attraction they see to being a DO rather than an MD? I think some people are attracted to the philosophy. It's more, it's, it is more holistic in a sense, or at least that's how it's supposed to be. Um, they think about the body as a unit, uh, and and you know there's more of an emphasis on on primary care. Yeah, more osteopathic graduates pursue primary care, but when you look at it, it's not all that different from the culture of an MD school. Um, why are people trying? You know, I think some people it's it's very difficult to get into medical school. Some people just cast a wide net, so they may not be so attracted to to the osteopathic philosophy but they're just going to apply to both so it's a it's a mix so uh, when you apply to both in other words you could go to medical school to be an md or medical school to be a do right you you choose one path or the other right from the beginning can't, right can't do both although it's interesting we have some uh some of my md resident colleagues are they've seen OMM and how fun it is. It's just really satisfying. Imagine you have your whole clinic day and someone comes in, they, it's a hospital discharge, you're going to titrate their diuretic meds to make sure their fluids are appropriate. And someone comes in with chronic kidney disease, diabetes. And, and, and then the next patient is an OMM and you get to be really present and, and work hands-on with this person. It's, it's intimate and and people feel better in that visit immediately um sometimes not completely but they, there's relief that they find after those 30 minutes and it's it's really gratifying so point being some of my md colleagues are training in omm even though they had they weren't osteopaths right all right yeah. we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back with doc zach Burns. All right. If you've ever wanted to show off your plant-based lifestyle and do it in style, here's your chance. We have some of the most amazing t-shirts, hats, accessories, coffee mugs, and more at shop.realmeneatplants.com. We have statement t-shirts that will bring a smile to everyone's face. I love the I want tofu tonight tea. Plus, we have podcast teas, real women eat plants gear, real kids eat plants, and real people eat plants, just in case men, women, and kids didn't cover it all. Yeah, we love you and love that you want to show off 
that healthy lifestyle of yours. Again, check out our high-quality gear at shop.realmeneatplants.com and enjoy. All right, we're talking with Dr. Zach Burns, who's currently doing a residency at Brown University. Uh, Zach, tell us about that residency. Uh, what are you in working in hospitals and clinics? What's your daily life like? Sure. Well, so I'm in family medicine. You, you when you're applying to residency, you got to pick. I'm going to do family medicine, internal, emergency, surgery, all these things. And uh, for me, I always wanted to do primary care. But I wasn't sure if I would do family med or internal med. Uh, family med became more more compelling to me. You get to work with babies. Um, you do some obstetrics, deliver them. Um, you work with kids, and you, all the way up to geriatrics. And and so it's it's a full lifespan, um, huge variety in terms of the illnesses and pathology you see. And so here I am doing family med. Um, the in residency you basically it's quite the task for our faculty right they have to transform a medical student into a fully licensed physician in three years so what does that metamorphosis look like um it's it's interesting um i'm two and a half years in basically each month is different we have this schedule that with a million different neon colors and each month is a different service that you're on. So you might be on hospital service. Um, you might be in the emergency room and the next month you're in the outpatient clinic and it rotates through, but it's a pretty broad training that we do in family. It includes surgery and the different subspecialties. So we can get a sense of the whole medical landscape um, in order to ultimately most of us do primary care, um, but we but it's it's nice to have trained in the hospital, so we know what's happened to the patient when he or she arrives, you know, and and um and then we're eligible also to to be hospitalists ourselves. So there you go. Um, so I'm guessing that more than once you have had patients, let's say in the clinic, who have been overweight or obese, pre-diabetic or diabetic, or, or have uh, cardiovascular disease. And I'm guessing you have wanted to talk to them about their diet. Have you, have you done so? That's a good guess. Yes, I do whenever I have the opportunity. Now, is there an attending over your shoulder who's, who's, who's listening as you're meeting with these patients? They're, uh, it's more figuratively over our shoulder. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So not, we, they're not, they're not in the room at the same time. They're not in the room. What happens is you, you see the patient independently and then you go meet with the attending in a different room. We call it precepting and you review the case and, and then it depends some, you know, and earlier in training, they'll come into the room to say hello to the patient, ask if they have any questions, maybe repeat part of the exam. And then they, then they leave. All right, so they're not in the room as you're talking to the patients about diet. Then do you go back and talk with the, the attending says, what did you talk to them about? And do you tell the attending that the subject of diet came up? I do. I mean, the, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, my faculty are generally supportive of, of lifestyle um, as medicine, which is great. Sometimes it starts to conflict with the models of treatment that they're used to and that they feel comfortable with. So there has been tension sometimes. Um, in terms of, imagine it's like a threshold for starting or increasing a drug, right? Mm -hmm. That's where we might have some tension. So um, for me, if, if someone has new onset type two diabetes and their sugars elevated but not terrible then i i feel they deserve uh to know that if they brought their a1c down below 6.5 for three months off meds they don't have diabetes anymore even the american diabetes association who takes 
generous donations from food and drug industries uh, says so. So, so I want people to have that choice, and then to and and I think they deserve education on how specifically we could achieve that remission from diabetes. But you'll have other providers who may have a lower threshold for starting metformin or starting one of the new diabetes drugs uh, on someone with the same A1C. So that's where there can be a little conflict, but we try to work it out. Now, have you had success where you've gotten patients who are uh, at that level of uh, uh, being slightly diabetic, but not, not dangerously diabetic, and they go on a plant-based diet, and a month or two later, their A1C is in an acceptable range? Yeah, the other day, I was very proud to see this, this 60-year-old um, who reverses diabetes. So he, he hadn't been in primary care in a while. Um, and he came back and sugar was high, you know, A1C was around eight. Okay. So definitely diabetes. It, his A1C had been eight. Right. Originally. Right. And so it was certainly in the diabetic range and, and, um, he was, he was on metformin already, if I recall. And then, uh, he was like, doc, I, I want to do this on my own. I let's. So he, he had the initiative, but we stopped the metformin and um, he was stable otherwise. So I might have waited a little longer to see him back. But I said, come back in exactly three months. Um, and if we if we check your A1C and it's uh, below 6.5 off metformin, then you don't have diabetes anymore. So and that's that's what he did. And did he promise to go plant based for those three months? He was largely plant-based, not exclusively. Okay. You know, it's all relative. So he was eating a standard diet. He was having like the junkiest of, of stuff, you know, M&Ms and Pop-Tarts and, uh, and also lots of meat. And he cut down um, entirely on the processed uh, carbohydrates and then mostly with the meat and dairy. And he did really well. So now we, you know, and, and, and he lost weight. He just looks good. He's, he's got that glow. So, so after three months, what did his A1C come down to? It's 6.2. Okay. All right. So have you had many success stories like that? There are a ton already. And I've only been in the game a little while. It just speaks to the power of, of plants. I mean, it, it, really, it actually works, but you know, it's, it, it is challenging as a resident because say you have a middle-aged patient, they might've been in this clinic for a long time and they've worked with other residents before you got there and other attendings and they didn't have the same disposition, um, uh, around or, or views around, around lifestyle medicine. So they may not like you didn't start them early. And so now they're already on 10, 15, 20 drugs. And it's, it can be challenging to reverse disease when they're entrenched, um, especially when you know that you're going to be passing that patient on to, to a younger resident soon. So it's, it's tricky when you don't have full continuity, um, but you can still do it. Yeah. Have, have you ever had any attendings notice that you're having more more success than they might have had with patients. I don't know if um if they would call it that or admit <laughs> that, but I, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um. No, I mean everyone everyone has their strengths. I think some people are like just like I'm uh, deep in the in the lifestyle medicine movement. Other people are working on hepatitis C and. Someone else is working on osteoporosis and um, mm -hmm. they, you know, I, I respect all of their niches and, and expertise. Um, and some of them do procedures. So they're doing, they're, they're delivering babies. They're doing, there's medicine is so broad, but um, in the, in the realm of 
chronic disease. Um, yes, I contend that <laughs> our, the current model is not working and that, you know, our generation has something to say about this and, and we should, <laughs> we, we need to, to shift um, how we approach chronic disease management and primary care urgently. Are there other residents like you at Brown University who are practicing plant-based medicine? There are a few of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there are, yeah, someone was really big on it. He graduated last year. He continues to advocate lifestyle medicine. And, and there are a few coming up, so. All right, good. So so there's some cause for hope there? There's some cause for hope. You know, I'm actually quite optimistic because this has to happen. I mean, and, and you also have the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, the ACLM, right. who has this concerted effort across the, the world, really. But they have over 150 med student groups um, with regular programming on this, on this content. So that's really because a few years ago, they, it was more like 50, they've grown 300%. And same with their, their, um, residency groups. So that they're, they're helping residency programs incorporate a, a lifestyle medicine curriculum. Um, and they have hundreds of these, which is, which is new. It's blossoming. Now, there's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and there's the Plantrition Project. Yes. And both are organizations that promote plant-based medicine. Is there any reason why there are two, two of these organizations instead of one? Is there any distinction between them? I think there is. I don't know as much about Plantrition Project. I love what they're doing, but they, there might be a slightly different approach and strategy. And then... It seems like the ACLM is is trying to be um, one of these major medical societies, just like the American College of X or Y cardiology or, or mm -hmm. gynecology, and um, and to to build legitimacy that way. And I think they've done it. Whereas some of the other lifestyle medicine organizations are just a different approach. I think there's ample room for for all of them. Okay. All right. Now, you also write poetry, Zach. Is that right? I do. Yeah, you've got a website, uh, herbivores.life, where people can find out more about you and even sample some of your poetry. Um, is, is writing poetry something you've done for a long time? I guess so. I think since high school, well... I, I, my creative writing kind of started after college, right? After I was assigned to write, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to keep doing it. Uh, I started to write about my experiences and my observations. And so, yeah, there, there are a bunch, the ones that have a, a, a vegan theme are there on the writing page of Herbivore Style Life. So there's some prose, there's some poetry, but it's, I enjoy it. Um, it's a different part of my mind. I get to, um, use and express myself. Well, the, the name of that domain, herbivores.life, um, is important because the, the idea that humans are herbivores is really central to our case. Um, you know, there, there are all kinds of uh, 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 dissections of our diet where people make the case for protein or for one enzyme or or one uh, you know compound uh, that that uh, that people argue about in 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 the medical literature but then there's the overall view the 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 broad picture which is humans are herbivores it's you know if you look at anatomical structure you compare the anatomical st structure of mammalian carnivores to mammalian herbivores to mammalian omnivores in every way we are herbivores and once you once you recognize that everything else sort of falls into place do you, do you see it that way too 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I get like to nerd out about anatomy and fossils and, and um, you know, these fecal lists where you can see how much fiber our ancestors were eating. But for me, actually, I don't necessarily care what we used to do. It's like it's 2024 and the, the times change. And I think for a lot of people, maybe even myself, it's like, let's think about um, our moral obligation in the context of now. It doesn't matter so much what we used to do. But there's reason enough to change and completely revamp our food system based on what it's doing to human health, animals, and the environment. Right. Yeah. Um, do you find in you, well, how about your family? Do Did other members of your family follow you to this diet? Well, I would say I followed my mom. She was the original nutrition geek. But um, and I just turned it up the next level. So Basically, in other words, she was leaning plant based, but you you went vegan. Right. She and my dad were vegetarian before kids. Right. And like many parents in the 90s, they thought that just society was telling them you can't safely raise kids plant based. And so they relapsed um, when they had kids and we started eating birds and fish and um <laughs> and lots of um, dairy cow secretions. So we, uh, that was my childhood, but my mom was always nutrition oriented and she, yeah. she, she recognized the, the insidious harm of, of the processed junk. Um, and we didn't do red meat. So, and then, you know, so now I kind of turned it up a notch and I um, lobby my family to follow along. They have um, to, to different extents. Yeah. My my mother, when she was pregnant with me, decided that she would raise me as a vegetarian. And the doctor talked her out of it, said oh. her, told her that, you know, my brain wouldn't grow and I would be shriveled and I, my bones wouldn't be strong and I might not survive at all. So my mother got talked out of it and I grew up eating McDonald's. Uh and then I asked my mother, what, why were you going to raise me as a vegetarian? Nobody, you're not a vegetarian. Nobody else is. And she said that when she was pregnant with me, I felt like a vegetarian. <laughs> what an insightful I, person. Yeah, I, it was a remarkable insight, but I don't know how she came to that. Um, how great. about your friends? Have you have have many of your friends gone vegetarian or vegan? I'm very proud of my friends that yes, um, they're all working, working that way. I, I, I can't think of a single close friend who is sort of obstinate, like, no, I'm not going there. Um, mm -hmm. Some have completely gone vegan and, and others are on their way. Um, and it's really beautiful to see that um, there's, we got a friend group from high school and there's, there's about eight of us. There's me, but I was always a little eccentric and, and weird. Mm -hmm. um, but when one of our other friends, who's more of the social leader, went vegan, people raised an eyebrow like, oh, it's, this is not <laughs> this is it's not just this fringe thing. Here's this, this other dude who's a jock and he's a cool <laughs> guy. Yeah. He went vegan. And so a lot of people are like, well, that's that's interesting. Um, I think we're going to see that and imagine my, my group of friends amplified, you know, around the country. There are all these kind of groups of friends who grew up around the same time and people are catching on. All right. Well, that's, yeah. you're giving me some optimism here. That's good. Um, do you think that, um, do you, do you, do you know what you're going to do after you complete your residency? Vaguely, Yes. So What's I'm that? moving up to Rochester, New York. Okay. Now I know there's yeah. a very active Rochester lifestyle medicine group. There is. Yeah. With Dr. Barnett. And, right. Yeah. So it's actually a, a hub for lifestyle medicine. Right. Given it's a smaller city. So I'm excited about that. Um, I will be doing mostly clinical time working in primary care. Um, of course, with a lifestyle medicine emphasis. 
and then part time I'll work with um, Dr. Clapper's Moving Medicine Forward, sort of for the first time in an official capacity because I've been volunteering all these years, and it's it's neat. I, I'll get to um, just put more designated time into our um, projects. Now, do you ever meet with patients who give you pushback? You you advise them that you say, look, if you want to lose weight and get off metformin and and uh, reverse diabetes, you you need to eat a plant based diet. And they say, that's nonsense. You need meat for the protein, and you're giving me bad advice. And where did you learn this nonsense? You know, do they do you ever get pushback from patients? I do. Usually, it's not. Usually, they don't challenge the science. Um, usually they would just say it's, I'm not, not doing that. <laughs> I, I'm not someone who, um, would consider reducing or eliminating animal products, right. In their own words, they say, and, um, that's okay, ultimately, but my job is to provide the option. Right. I, I think they should have, should be able to make an informed decision. Just like, you know, informed consent before you do anything in medicine. Right. People need to know um, the what you're offering, the alternatives and the risks and benefits. That's how I see any sort of decision point with chronic disease. So as long as I'm really thoughtfully counseling people on lifestyle, then I'm doing, doing the job. And of course, it's just like smoking. Some people are going to say no, but. Um, you got to bring it up again, compassionately right. and, and persistently. The next time they come in, um, you bring it up again, see how you can help. And of course, you got to connect with people. It's not like, hey, well, you, know, you don't want them to to dread coming and, and disappointing you that they didn't make the change. Right. You want to set this um, expectation that you are on their team regardless. And they can they can fail. Um, but when they come in, you're, you're going to be honest and and talk about what you'd recommend. Have you ever had patients who initially said, no, I can't do that? And maybe the second time is the, their dosage of metformin has to be increased. They say, all right, tell me tell me again about the rice and veggies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, it's a good question. Basically, there are a couple junctures where they might get scared. One is if they are recommended to start insulin because they might have just been on pills and then they're being told to inject something every day. And some of them are spooked and they say, all right, what else you got? <laughs> uh, other people might have had a cardiac event, a heart attack or a stroke, and they're ready to change. Yeah, They're looking at their future and they have a a grandchild and the yeah. wedding coming up and you know um so unfortunately sometimes it takes an escalation of their disease yeah well dr burns continued success go out there and keep encouraging people to get themselves healthy um and i hope the uh the the move to rochester is rewarding for you and uh and please keep help please keep this movement going i know you will well i consider you a a valuable teammate i love um the work you do and all your writing and speaking so thanks for having me glenn well thank you and you could find out more about dr zach burns at herbivores.life we'll see you next time this has been the Glenn Mercer Show, where everyone listening turns vegan, regains their health, and annoys their friends and relatives. Find us on YouTube at the Glenn Mercer Show and across all your major podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>